Welcome to the Folktale Project, this is Dan Schulz. Today we have a very special treat. As often comes up in the Topaz storybook, we have tales that were captured and written down for us by rather famous authors. And this is one such story. Today's tale of Queen Aster is an imagining of the relationship between the Goldenrod and the Aster, as seen by... Louisa May Alcott, the author of Little Women. And it's, it's quite an interesting tale as it paints them as royalty. This is Queen Aster. For many seasons the golden rods had reigned over the meadow, and no one thought of choosing a king from any other family, for they were strong and handsome and loved to rule. But one autumn... Something happened which caused a great excitement among the flowers. It was proposed to have a queen, and such a thing had never been heard of before. It began among the asters, for some of them grew outside the wall beside the road and saw and heard what went on in the great world. These sturdy plants told the news to their relations inside, and so the asters were unusually wise and energetic flowers from the little white stars in the grass to the tall sprays tossing their purple plumes above the mossy wall. Things are moving in the great world, and it is time we made a change in our little one, said one of the roadside asters after a long talk with a wandering wind. Matters are not going well in the meadow for the golden rod's rule, and they care only for money and power, as their name shows. Now, We are descended from the stars, and are both wise and good, and our tribe is even larger than the Goldenrod tribe. So it is but fair that we should take our turn at governing. It will soon be time to choose, and I propose our stately cousin, Violet Aster, for queen this year. Whoever agrees with me, say aye. Quite a shout went up from all the Asters, and the late clovers and buttercups joined in it, for they were honest, sensible flowers, and liked fair play. To their great delight, the pitcher plant, or forefather's cup, said I most decidedly, and that impressed all the other plants, for this fine family came over in the Mayflower, and was much honoured everywhere. But the proud cardinals by the brook blushed with shame at the idea of a queen, The fringed gentians shut their blue eyes that they might not see the bold asters, and Clematis fainted away in the grass. She was so shocked. The goldenrods laughed scornfully and were much amused at the suggestion to put them off the throne where they had ruled for so long. Let those discontented asters try it, they said. No one will vote for that foolish violet, and things will go on as they have always. So, Dear friends, don't be troubled, but help us elect our handsome cousin who was born in the palace this year. In the middle of the meadow stood a beautiful maple, and at its foot lay a large rock overgrown by a wild grapevine. All kinds of flowers sprang up here, and this autumn a tall spray of goldenrod and a lovely violet aster grew almost side by side, with only a screen of ferns between them. This was called the palace and seeing their cousin there made the asters feel that their turn had come, and many of the other flowers agreed with them that a change of rulers ought to be made for the good of the kingdom. So, when the day came to choose, there was great excitement as the wind went about collecting the votes. The golden rods, cardinals, gentians, clematis, and bittersweet voted for the prince, as they called the handsome fellow by the rock. All the asters, buttercups, clovers, and pitcher plants voted for violet, and to the surprise of the meadow, the maple dropped a leaf, and the rock gave a bit of lichen for her also. They seldom took part in the affairs of the flower people, the tree living so high above them busy with its own music, and the rock being so old that it seemed lost in meditation most of the time. But they liked the idea of a queen, for one was a poet and the other a philosopher, and both believed in gentle violet. Their votes won the day, and with loud rejoicing by her friends she was proclaimed queen of the meadow and welcomed to her throne. We will never go to court or notice her in any way, cried the haughty cardinals, red with anger. 
nor we. Dreadful, unfeminine creature. Let us turn our backs and be grateful that the brook flows between us, added the gentians, shaking their fringes as if the mere idea soiled them. Clematis hid her face among the vine leaves, feeling that the palace was no longer a fit home for a delicate high-born flower like herself. All the golden rods raged at this dreadful disappointment, and said many untrue and disrespectful things of Violet. The prince tossed his yellow head behind the screen, and laughed as if he did not mind, saying carelessly, Let her try. She can never do it, and will soon be glad to give up and let me take my proper place. So, the meadow was divided. One half turned its back on the new queen, the other half loved, admired, and believed in her, and all waited to see how the experiment would succeed. The wise asters helped her with advice. The pitcher plant refreshed her with the history of the brave Puritans who loved liberty and justice and suffered to win them. The honest clovers sweetened life with their sincere friendship, and the cheerful buttercups brightened her days with kindly words and deeds but her best help came from the rock and the tree. For when she needed strength, she leaned her delicate head against the rough breast of the rock, and courage seemed to come to her from the wise old stone that had borne the storms of a hundred years. When her heart was heavy with care or wounded by unkindness, she looked up to the beautiful tree, always full of soft music, always pointing heavenward, and was comforted by these glimpses of a world above her. The first thing she did was to banish the evil snakes from her kingdom, for they lured the innocent birds to death and filled many a happy nest with grief. The next task was to stop the red and black ants from constantly fighting, for they were always at war to the great dismay of more peaceful insects. She bade each tribe to keep in its own country, and if any dispute came up, to bring it to her, and she would decide it fairly. This was a hard task, for the ants loved to fight and would go on struggling after their bodies were separated from their heads, so fierce they were. But she made them friends at last, and everyone was glad. Another reform was to purify the news that came to the meadow. The wind was the telegraph messenger, but the birds were reporters, and some of them very bad ones. The larks brought tidings from the clouds and were always welcome. The thrushes from the wood and all loved to hear their pretty romances. The robins had domestic news, and the lively wrens bits of gossip and witty jokes to relate. But the magpies made such mischief with their ill-natured tattle and evil tales, and the crows criticized and condemned everyone who did not believe and do just as they did. So the magpies were forbidden to go gossiping about the meadow, and the gloomy black crows were ordered off the fence where they liked to sit cawing dismally for hours at a time. Everyone felt safe and comfortable when this was done except the cardinals, who liked to hear their splendid dresses and fine feasts talked about, and the goldenrods, who were so used to living in public that they missed the excitement as well as the scandal of the magpies and the political and religious arguments and quarrels of the crows. A hospital for sick and homeless creatures was opened under the big burdock leaves, and there several belated butterflies were tucked up in their silken hammocks to sleep till spring. A sad ladybug who had lost all her children found comfort in her loneliness, and many crippled ants sat talking over their battles like old soldiers in the sunshine. It took a long time to do all this, and it was a hard task, for the rich and powerful flowers gave no help. But the asters worked bravely, so did the clovers and buttercups, and the pitcher plant kept open house with old-fashioned hospitality one so seldom sees nowadays. Everything seemed to prosper, and the meadow grew more beautiful day by day. Safe from their enemies the snakes, birds came to build in all the trees and bushes, singing their gratitude so sweetly that there was always music in the air. Sunshine and shower seemed to love to freshen the thirsty flowers and keep the grass green till every plant grew strong and fair, and passers-by stopped to look, saying with a smile, What a pretty little spot this is! The wind carried tidings of these things to other colonies, and brought back messages of praise and good will from other rulers, glad to know the experiment worked so well. This made a deep impression on the goldenrods and their friends, for they could not deny that Violet had succeeded better than anyone dared to hope, and the proud flowers began to see that they would have to give in, own they were wrong, and become loyal subjects of this wise and gentle queen. 
We shall have to go to court if ambassadors keep coming with such gifts and honors to Her Majesty, for they wonder not to see us there, and will tell that we are sulking at home instead of shining as we only can, said the cardinals, longing to display their red velvet robes at the feasts which Violet was obliged to give in the palace when kings came to visit her. Our time will soon be over. I'm afraid we must humble ourselves or lose all the gaiety of the season. It is hard to see the good old ways changed, but if they must be, we can only gracefully submit, answered the Genshins, smoothing their delicate blue fringes, eager to be again the bells of the ball. Clematis astonished everyone by suddenly beginning to climb the maple tree and shake her silvery tassels like a canopy over the queen's head. I cannot live so near her and not begin to grow. Since I must cling to something, I choose the noblest I can find and look up, not down, for evermore, she said. For, like many weak and timid creatures, she was easily guided, and it was well for her that Violet's example had been a brave one. Prince Goldenrod found it impossible to turn his back entirely upon Her Majesty, for he was a gentleman, with a really noble heart under his yellow cloak. So he was among the first to see, admire, and love the modest, faithful flower who grew so near him. He could not help hearing her words of comfort or reproof to those who came to her for advice. He saw the daily acts of charity which no one else discovered. He knew how many trials came to her and how bravely she bore them. She had done more than ever we did to make the kingdom beautiful and safe and happy. I'll be the first to own it, to thank her, and offer her my allegiance, he said to himself, and waited for a chance. One night, when the September moon was shining over the meadow and the air was balmy with the last breath of summer, the prince ventured to serenade the queen on his wind harp. He knew she was awake, for he had peeped through the ferns and seen her looking at the stars with her violet eyes full of dew, as if something troubled her. So he sang his sweetest song, and her majesty leaned nearer to hear it, for she much longed to be friends with the gallant prince, because both were born in the palace, and grew up together very happily till coronation time came. As he ended, she sighed, wondering how long it would be before he told her what she knew was in his heart. Goldenrod heard the soft sigh, and forgetting his pride, he pushed away the screen and whispered, while his face shone and his voice showed how much he felt. What troubles you, sweet neighbor? Forget and forgive my unkindness, and let me help if I can. I dare not say as Prince Consort, though I love you dearly, but as a friend and faithful subject, for I confess that you are fitter to rule than I. As he spoke, the leaves that hid Violet's golden heart opened wide and let him see how glad she was, as she bent her stately head and answered softly, There is room upon the throne for two. Share it with me as king and let us rule together. What the prince answered only the moon knows. But when morning came, all the meadow was surprised and rejoiced to see the gold and purple flowers standing side by side while the maple showered its rosy leaves over them and the old rock waved his crown of vine leaves as he said, This is as it should be, love and strength going hand in hand and justice making the earth glad. The lands are lit with all the autumn blaze of goldenrod, and everywhere the purple asters nod and bend and wave and flit. Helen Hunt Jackson And that is Louisa May Alcott's Queen Aster. A story of courtly romance and, well, a changing of the guard with the changing of the times in the garden. This is Dan Scholes for the Folktale Project. Don't forget that you can subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Play, Overcast, anywhere that you like to get your podcasts. You can follow us on Twitter at Folktale Project. You can find us on Auto Radio, TuneIn Radio, iHeart Radio, Spotify, anywhere you like to listen. And you can always head over to folktaleproject.com you will find a new story waiting for you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. As always, thank you so much for listening. <laughs>